Praise the Lord for this morning. If that's not your testimony this morning, it should be. It needs to be. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you know, I was, I grew up steeped in tradition as many of us have over the years. Steeped in the, I grew up, everybody went to church. There might have been one or two in the community that didn't go to church. But everybody went to church. I don't know that everybody was saved, but they went to church. And it was, you could see people's lives, and, and yet today that is, that is true today. Do we see change in people's lives when they claim to be Christians? It's easy to become, and we talked about this Wednesday night, Baron. It's easy to, to become steeped in tradition, the tradition of the church. You go to church on Sunday and, and <clears throat> you do what's right. <coughs> Pardon me. And you, you give a little bit and and uh, and you're somebody asks you you're a Christian. Yes, you are. And, and you know the difference in right and wrong and you try to do the right things and you try not to do the wrong things. But are we yet today, is the church yet today steeped in tradition? Or is it the church that's being led by the Spirit? The difference that Christ made was He took the place for us. On the cross, He paid it all once and for all that we could be Christians. And they were first called Christians in Antioch because they acted like Jesus. And people said they're those Jesus people. They're those Jesus people. They act like him. There was something different about them. We talked about the early church this morning in Sunday school. And in that early church, they faced many obstacles. And, and life's not a lot different today. We still all face obstacles in our life. The devil has been diversifying since the beginning of time, since God, the garden, since he, he talked Eve into taking a bite of that fruit from that tree. And she convinced Adam to go along. He's been diversifying. He's been coming at people in every direction that he can think of. And today in the world, he offers every kind of fun that you can imagine, every kind of joy, pleasure that you can imagine, that you can think of, that you can dream about, is offered in the world today. Through social media, I'm stunned at what happens in social media. I'm stunned at what happens in society. What society has accepted today as right and what's wrong. If we weighed in scales what society believes is right and what the steeped in tradition church thinks is, is right against what's really right, the skills go like this. The world and tradition falls off. What's right is the Word of God. From the beginning in Genesis to the last Amen in the book of Revelation. It's a story about redemption. An opportunity for mankind to reclaim what God offered in the beginning. I believe that Adam and Eve had always been naked. But they were covered by the glory of God. Walking in 
in the perfection of God and walking and talking with God in the glory of God. They shared the glory of God. They had everything. God had made, had a plan and he made provision for anything that they needed. But he said, you've got to do it my way. You can't do it any other way. You have to do it my way. And that tree in the center over there, as sure as you eat from that, you shall surely die. If you believe the Bible, if you believe in God, you have to believe it all. Every word of it. Amen. That's the difference. That's the only truth that matters. We've been offered that opportunity. God had a mystery that he revealed in Jesus Christ. And the, and the, the scriptures tell us that it was a mystery. It was always a mystery that he knew before the foundations of the earth that his only begotten son would come and sacrifice himself upon the cross at Calvary to be the Lamb of God. God's own sacrifice to himself. A price had to be paid for sin. They had always shed blood, and it had to be shed blood that paid that price. Nothing else could pay for sin. And as early as it's recorded, there was blood sacrifice to make things right for man. But that was a shadow, a mere shadow of what he would offer us when he revealed that mystery some 2,000 years ago in a, in a son that he bore, or Mary bore, his son. The Holy Spirit came over Mary and she was with child. And when she birthed that child, he was all man and he was all God. But Jesus made it very clear throughout his ministry, his short ministry of three, some three and a half, short, three, short of a half, three and a half years, uh, that it was not he that did the work that was done. He didn't do the miracles. Don't be mistaken. Many people are mistaken. Jesus didn't do the miracle. God the Father did the miracles. Jesus told us that many times in the Gospels. It's not I who do the work, but it's God the Father. I only speak what my Father tells me to speak. I only do what he tells me to do. Jesus lived a life in faith, by faith. He had to trust in God the Father for everything. Although he was God, he gave up that glory to, to humble himself unto death. Paul tells us, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a servant. Being made in the likeness of men, he found himself in fashion as a man, and he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. There's some really good words there. Jesus lived in faith that God would resurrect him from the dead. He didn't want to die. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed so hard that he, his tears turned to blood. He didn't want to die. The man part of him did not want to die. No different than you and I. But he says, nevertheless, Father, thy will be done, not mine. The greater good. There was a greater cause. And he humbled himself. If Jesus had not humbled himself, they couldn't have killed him with 10,000 Sherman tanks. No way. But he did. He humbled himself. And he became obedient 
unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name that's above every name. The name of Jesus. That every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those things in heaven, those things in the earth, and then those things under the earth will bow down. The scripture tells us that every name, every name, every name bows under the name of Jesus. That means our names individually. That means the name of sin, the name of death, hell and the grave will bow. And I want to be there. I want to be there. He's coming back one day to receive his church. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that he's, he wants a glorious church. That's what he's coming for, to receive and to present to himself as his bride. And we will enter in to that glorious heaven or the new Jerusalem. I'm not sure exactly how all that will unfold. I'm, I, I'm not a preacher. I'm, I'm not ordained to be a preacher. But I am a Christian with a testimony <coughs> for God. For Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I'm thankful this morning that I can stand before you and say that I am, I know that 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 I know I'm saved and I'm going to be with Jesus. If you don't know that this morning, if you don't know that in your heart this morning, if you're steeped up in tradition, you're sitting there and I'm thankful you're here. And listen, it, it happened to me. It happened to many people. I know many people that were that, that got caught up in that. And then they realized through an encounter, an encounter, an encounter with God. God manifested himself in my life. I was raised <coughs> by a little, little short mother. She was four foot ten and a half. She was standing in my arm. I was so glad when I got to, when I reached the point that I could, she could stand up in my arm. It was a long time, Bruce. I was the smallest guy in my class, but I was the loudest. I was the I was the class clown in the center of attention in every supermarket parking lot. But she sowed seed in me. She took me to church. From the time I could walk, I remember being in church early on in revivals. And we had they had revivals in them days. <laughs> that was a fun. She dragged me to church. I said I had a drug problem early on in life because my mother drugged me to church. And there was <laughs> doors were open. <clears throat> and I'm thankful that she did because when I became a teenager, <clears throat> uh, I began to pursue the life that my father had lived. My mother was a saintly little woman. She loved the Lord and she was continually seeking a deeper experience with God. I remember there was a holiness movement that went on. Well, it began with the Wesleys, John, John Wesley, and in the early Methodist church before it became the United Methodist, and I'm not down in the United Methodist, but this is just facts. Uh, they were a more of a holiness church, a spirit-filled church. First time I ever heard anybody shout. It scared me. I was probably two and a half or three. I was standing up in the in the second pew, and uh, and I heard somebody, woo, woo, the preacher was preaching away, and and my mama said, "It's all right. It's all right. It's ain't Sally." <laughs> So it was my, I, I, 
I recounted this. I thought it was my grandma, but it was my grandma's sister. There were seven. She had seven. There were seven girls in my grandma's family, no, no guys. So uh, when they had a family reunion, you didn't get to talk much. <laughs> <laughs> But I saw her go pursue holiness in her life. And, and she I, I can remember talking to me, because I was the only one there for her to talk to at that time. She said, this sanctification, there's got to be more to this sanctification. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. And she'd sign up to go to camp meetings. And we rode a bus one time to, to Jackson, Kentucky. And, and somebody picked us up in a 51 shiver like. Slant back, I don't know what they call them. Some of you older guys probably know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, they picked us up and took us back up in the, we were in the mountain to begin with, they took us deeper back up into the mountain. But she was seeking God. She had a hunger. A hunger to know God deeper and richer and fuller. <laughs> She sought God until she had a, a Holy Ghost experience with him. I have her Bible at home. In the back of her Bible, <clears throat> she's got written when she received the Holy Spirit. She said, I have Damascus Road like experience. She was slain by the presence of God. God showed up because she saw that. She had a hunger. I'm so thankful that I was able to see that in my my early years. It was in here. And I, I played the, the traditional game every time I'd get in trouble with the law. I'd run back to church. I left the church probably in my early teens, 13. I was sneaking around and doing this and that. And pretty soon I just refused to go to church. And I was taking up what the world had to offer. My father was a, a wicked man. An evil man, and he was involved in, in, the, in a lot of things. And I'd go with him. He'd load me up in the car, and I'd stand up in the seat right beside him, and, and we'd hit all the bootlegging joints, and we'd gamble joints in East Tennessee and on the Virginia line, up in the mountains, down, the, down on the rivers, the little joints. And I began to pursue that, that kind of lifestyle. What I needed all along was the love that you talked about, brother. I needed love. And there's an emptiness in each of us that we're born with. And it's that emptiness, that empty hole where God's supposed to be. And if God's not in there, you'll never feel it with anything else. There's nothing else that you can fill that hole with. But the love of God gives you a satisfaction that you never know. And I've tried everything. Almost. If it, was, if it felt good, I wanted to do it. I tried. I grew up, my teen years were in the 60s. So I played around with God until I was 63 years old. And at 63, my life became completely broken. I had nothing left. Uh, my family was broken. My life was broken. I was facing uh, a jail sentence, a prison sentence. I remembered. I remembered what my 
Mama had to stop eating. I remember about that Jesus that she loved and sought after. And I asked him to come in and take over my life for the first time. And I gave him everything that I had in my heart. All the little hidden pockets. All the little hidden drawers. All the little things that I snuck around and done. I said, Lord, if, if, if you will come and help me out of this, I'll serve you. I'll give it all to you this time. And God manifested in my life. I began to do the things that I'd seen my mother do. I began to get up each morning and pick up my Bible first thing and go into my prayer closet and pray and read my Bible. I can remember talking to the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't understand, but I believe it. And I know that I've got to take it by faith. I've got to believe everything that it says. <clears throat> so I began to read it in Genesis, and I read it all the way through. And God revealed to me relationships. During that time, I had been in church my whole life, in and out. I had known about God. I had pretended to serve God. But I now know that I know. That I know that I know that I know that I know. I have a relationship with a living God. The God that created each of us. Who knew us before we were in our mother's womb. That's the real truth. The world don't preach that truth. It don't tell you about that truth. It steers away from the truth. <clears throat> but you were created to serve a living God. To be a child of the king. To live in his kingdom. To be a kingdom heir. A joint heir with Jesus to the kingdom of God. But you have to choose that. You have to choose that route. That's the route you want to go. You have to make the choices in your life. If you believe God is real, and I'm going to give you some assurance, He's real. Amen. God manifested in my life and began to change circumstances in my life. When I began to seek Him, He began to show up. And He yet shows up today. I still seek Him. I'm, still, I'm more hungry than I ever was. I still make mistakes. My wife's got a list. <laughs> it could be a book. I still make mistakes. But that's what the great grace of God is all about. Grace, the favor of God. I've been I've studying that word. That word in the Hebrew is Chesed, 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 C-H-E-S-E-D. And it's, it's the greater blessing the lesser. It's the favor of God poured out upon his children, upon his church. That's what we all live in if we're serving him. Allah says I need to shut up and, and get out of here. So I, I'm going to call the the girls back up the organ and piano. Brother, if you want to do the invitation. If you don't know Jesus this morning, if you don't know him, if you don't have a personal experience with him this morning, I beg you, I beg you to come and try. Come and try. If you've got an issue, he can resolve it. If you've got a hurt, he can fix it. If you're sick, he can heal. He has the answers. From the front cover of that Bible to the back cover of it is an answer to any problem that you'll ever face in this life. And he promises you. There's promise after promise after promise after promise after promise after promise for his children. And I partake in that every moment of every day. 
And you do too. You live in this world by the grace and the mercy of God. That's the only reason you're alive today, is by the grace of God. God is sovereign. He rules it all. His kingdom is in the heavens, but he's ruler over all. Not the world. <clears throat> Not the Russian leader. Not any leader. There is none above God. It's all about God and there's nothing else that it's about. Anything else is a lie. And it's time. That's what's wrong with the world today. Now I'll, I'll get out of the way. You need Jesus in your life. You need to have an active relationship with him. Don't miss the trumpet sound. Don't miss the call. Don't miss the rising up to meet him in the air. It's real. It's real. Don't pass that opportunity. God bless you.